uh, welcome. This is the uh, last day now of this event. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see some of the conversations have just been phenomenal. So, some great exchange of information uh, amongst everyone. So uh, this, is, uh, this is very exciting for me now taking over as director and looking at, at how this has formed over several years to try to bring it to this, this, this event of this size. So um, I want to thank everybody for that. One, one thing I do want to say is there's one group that I have not thanked that is uh, important. And if I could get, they're probably all in the back, but um, my, my core division is what puts this on for ACI, so the um, cyber operations research element. I'll give a brief later today about um, kind of how we break down ACI. But uh, Lieutenant Colonel Todd Arnold and, and his team back there uh, put in a lot of work, uh, especially in the last month or so, of, uh, of trying to make sure the logistics and all of the pieces and parts came together to make this happen. And, from my viewpoint, it looks fairly seamless from the group chat that I'm on with them. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of things that had to be kind of wickered out to make everything work. So I know they're doing a lot of work. So if they could stand up, we can give them a round of applause here. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay, so um, our, um, I'm going to introduce now our next speaker. Um, the, uh, as I said, I've been in ACI for um, about five years. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, but I've, I've, most people think I'm an electrical engineer just because I'm, I have a ham radio license and I um, do so much on the radio. I got sucked into this, this thing in 2018 when electronic warfare um, got moved over to cyber. So in ACI as a researcher, I was working a lot with trying to understand where we're at with EW. Turns out not not in the best spot, but we are moving very quickly to get much better at it. So um, uh, one great thing that um, I get to see at ACI now being here longer is I get to see some of our uh, researchers um, come through, get their graduate, we pick them, they go to grad school, then they come through ACI, and then they go out and do great things in the Army. And uh, that's exactly who this next speaker is. So Major Steve Whittem, uh, class of uh, 2009, so he was here when I first taught. Boy, I'm getting old. Um, so uh, uh, I think probably was a CDX person then too, right? So um, which we, I don't even think we do that anymore. Um, the uh, he came through and did a lot of great work with ACI with um, a, a, an event called Jack Voltaic, which is now in uh, FM 3.0. It's actually listed in Appendix C, so you could check that out. We get a little ACI gets a shout out, so. Um, the, uh, the exercise was basically looking at kind of an infrastructure, looking at more than just a, um, a post and saying, okay, we can deploy. Well, what happens if you leave or what happens if your power gets cut out or what happens if the port is, is, has been cyber attacked? And looking at the bigger picture. And so he worked on that here at ACI. But as, as you've seen in the past few days, 17 Alpha, 17 Bravo, we go back and forth, we have to do different missions. He's now in like a 17 Bravo slot. So he went from ACI researcher, looking at infrastructure, now looking at the tactical edge and looking at um, the electronic warfare piece of the mission. So um, that's what you, you have to be expected to do as you, uh, as you grow throughout the branch. So um, with that, I'd like to welcome Major Steve Whittem. All right, good morning. Really appreciate having the opportunity, so thank you, sir, for, for the invitation. Um, thanks to the ACI team for bringing me back. I really enjoy uh, getting this, this kind of an opportunity, and this has been thrilling, actually, for me to get to, to meet all the cadets uh, that are coming through. I've sat at, at most of your tables, so some of you have, have already discovered that I love to hear myself talk. Um, now you have to listen to me because I'm the programmed speaker for the next 20 to 30 minutes, so... Um, it's a match made in heaven. I like, I like to talk, and they're giving me the opportunity. So um, as Colonel Hamilton mentioned, my name is Major Steve Whittem. I am currently the Chief of Cyber and Electromagnetic Activities at 10th Mountain Division. Um, that will be the fifth time in my life that I have used the full title. The other four times were previous uh, table discussions that I've had here in this room, because nobody says that full acronym. It's just SEMA. Um, but, uh, what does that mean? It means that first and foremost, I am the principal advisor for all things cyber and electronic warfare for 
the CG, the commanding general of 10th Mountain Division. Um, and my section is responsible for coordinating electronic warfare assets from joint uh, forces and the organic assets that we have in 10th Mountain Division in a large-scale combat operation or LISCO fight as part of what is now uh, multi-domain operations. Um, prior to that, um, even before coming over to, uh, to being a cyber officer, uh, in a former life I was an MI officer. Um, and I was the last SIGINT platoon leader in the Army to have spent time uh, in a recon squadron. So when SIGINT what took over the role of electronic warfare for the Army, uh, there was a transition that was made over the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to move SIGINT uh, from the tactical into the, into the MICO and at the, at the brigade combat teams that, that mission uh, sustained, but the, the uh, transition meant that we were no longer aligned directly underneath the, the CAV. So I got a chance to actually do, for all you 17 Bravo aspiring lieutenants, I got a chance to do tactical electronic support before I even knew that it was electronic support. We called it tactical SIGINT, um, but it's, it's essentially the same mission. So I'm gonna be speaking a little bit this morning about um, what uh, your responsibilities are going to be as a 17 Bravo platoon leader. Um, but I have to start off by saying that just about everybody yesterday took all my material. So thanks, General Vile. Thanks, uh, General Stanton. Thanks, Lieutenant Price. You, uh, you covered most of what I had intended to speak about. So I'm going to shift a little bit towards kind of what I do specifically, um, how 10th Mountain views the upcoming uh, environment and the uh, types of engagements that 10th Mountain expects to be involved in and how we see cyber and electromagnetic activities playing a role in that, and particularly how electronic warfare is gonna play a role in that. So let me start with a little bit of what I see the future of electronic warfare and, and large-scale combat operations being. Last 20 years, Iraq and Afghanistan, we've been involved in a counterinsurgency or coin fight. Second EW, very individual targeting focused, trying to build a pattern of life on a target, trying to identify you know, who they are, where they are, uh, how they operate so that we can find them and kill them. The basic principles are the same, but the targets change in a, in a large scale combat operation. I no longer care about the individual, I no longer care even about, um, for, from a targeting perspective at the division level, I don't, I don't really care about platoons. What I care about are the things that are going to help the enemy find me and kill me. And in particular, what I as a SEMA officer care about is helping the targeting officer identify and target and kill the things that the commander wants dead first. In order of priority, we would see something like counter-battery radar. How does that work? Well, you, you fire from a firing point artillery rounds, and a counter-battery radar is going to track the trajectory of that projectile back to the, the source. What can you do once you know where the source of that fire is? Well, you can lay rounds on target, and you can do so pretty accurately. So counter-battery radar is a high payoff target. It's a high priority target. Um, air defense, integrated air defense systems, again, radars. Uh, why do we care about those? Well, for any tactical formation, the Combat Aviation Brigade is the most lethal element in, in that formation. The amount of pain that an Apache can strap on the underside and deliver is something quite spectacular. There is nothing more lethal than the cab, but they are vulnerable. So you want to protect them by preventing the enemy from using their integrated air defense systems from tracking and shooting down uh, your, your combat aviation brigade elements. The third priority, and these, depending on the, the time of the operation, these are interchangeable, these top three priorities, are enemy ISR, in, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets. A lot of this is unmanned aerial systems, drones, right? And especially more recently, what we're seeing is a proliferation of what are called Group 1 or Category 1 
uh, UASs. These are quadcopters. These are commercial off the shelf, 50 to $200 um, with good cameras. Quadcopters, I mean, if any of you are watching you know, modern vloggers fly their, 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 uh, their drones and take you know, these high quality pictures, there's some military application to that, right? It is not cost effective to fire a $10,000 round at a $50 quadcopter. This is not a thing, right? There are much better targets for those expensive munitions. So how do we combat those, right? In those top three priorities, what have I not listed? Individuals, platoons, the type of targeting that we have seen in counterinsurgency. What have I talked about? I have talked about systems that rely on the EMS, the electromagnetic spectrum, for communication and operation. Radars, in particular, emit an incredibly loud and bright signal. They have to, because that signal has to bounce off of something in the air and return with a sufficient signal strength for the radar to identify and track whatever it is that it, that it bounced off of. It's a very strong signal, which means it can be detected from very far away. So that's the type of targeting that, that we do, and that, I'm, that I'm responsible for providing input to the staff. 10th Mountain Division recently went through, it was actually before I arrived at 10th Mountain Division, through what's called a warfighter. The warfighter is a division level staff exercise where you're doing a force on force engagement, right? General officers give orders, staffs plan, and then the simulator uh, through its algorithm determines what the results are each day. And you're doing a force on force engagement at a core level. Um, 10th Mountain Division was wildly successful with its SEMA efforts to create what in multi-domain operations is called a convergence window. The convergence window is when you are able to align all of your assets to create a particular window of time, could be two hours, could be a day, where you can have maximal impact and create for your adversary multiple dilemmas, multiple decisions that they have to, to make. You're so successful in the warfighter, in fact, that in two hours, we completely eliminated all of the enemy's sophisticated integrated air defense systems. And in order to make the game continue to be challenging, the, uh, the, the uh, civilians reconstituted all of the air defense. They cheated and they brought it all back. They had to, because otherwise the game was going to be too easy from that point forward. Fast forward four months, I finally arrived and we're playing a higher command now for 3rd Infantry Division as they go through their warfighter. And we did it again. Even though we went into the, the menu of items and, said, and, and they had explicitly prevented what my warrant officer did to them last time. But we found another way to create that same convergence window. And once again, as the higher headquarters, blow up all of the enemy air defense systems and they had to reconstitute again. And we weren't even the target audience. They had to do it for 3rd ID so that 3rd ID could go through their paces and actually have the challenge. So 10th Mountain Division leadership actually gets what is at least possible. Now I will say about this, the SIM, a lot of this is white carded. We were way more effective than we would actually have been in reality. But that's better than being less effective. But the point is that the leadership across the army is really starting to come to appreciate what electronic warfare can bring on the modern battlefield. They're beginning to appreciate it not because necessarily of what we did in the war sim, they're appreciating it because of what's going on in Ukraine. But they don't understand it yet. And that's where we come in. But at least you're going to have a commander that wants to know. And so Challenge number one for all of you lieutenants, whether you're an Alpha or a Bravo, is I'm going to just repeat what previous speakers have said. You have to know your stuff. Now, 10th Mountain has a few challenges. Um, we are presently at three out of 15 officers, three officers for the 15 authorizations in 10th Mountain. Pretty soon I will be leaving, it's a different story, and, and there will be another officer, another 04 who's leaving, and 
as, it, as things stand right now, the senior 17 in 10th Mountain Division come September is going to be an 02. Manning is a challenge. Things hopefully will improve as you matriculate out to the force, but you're joining a branch that is under strength and in high demand. And in particular, EW, very under strength and in high demand. Okay. What I need from the, you, you future lieutenants is this. You need to be able to step up two ranks because it's entirely possible that you may find yourself going to a brigade combat team and there's no 04 filling the 04 spot. And you may be pulled up to staff because that's where the brigade commander feels you can be best utilized. You may dual hat as the platoon leader and do staff time while you're leading your formation. That's, that's a real possibility. So, how are you going to lead that formation? You've heard previous guest speakers say, I need you to be competent. I need you to lead. I need you to understand troop leading procedures. I need you to take care of your people. All of that is true. My challenge to you is you need to be better than your peers in other branches. On top of everything else, you need to know multi-domain operations. You need to know FM 5-0, operational terms and graphics. You need to be able to explain what you mean when you say destroy or deny, disrupt, degrade or manipulate. You need to be able to speak in those terms because that is the language of our profession. And not all the lieutenants in the other branches actually have to speak in those terms outside of their own branch until they hit staff planning level, until they hit even sometimes joint. Okay? So I need you to be better than, I need you to continue to earn your place in this competitive branch that you selected into, and it's a hard branch to get into. Um, now, for those of you who are going to be 17 Bravos, I want to explain a little bit about what the modern battlefield is going to look like. We've talked a little bit about targeting, but the division is going back to, so the army is transitioning back to the division being the unit of action, right? It used to be the, the we, over the counterinsurgency, we, we made the, the brigade combat teams the unit of action. It meant that all the assets that, were, that the commander needed were pushed down to that level. It's coming back, the army's gonna transition back to the division um, so that brigades, infantry brigades, are going to be maneuver elements again. They will still have assets, but most of the um, capabilities are going to be held and, app and apportioned out from the division level. Which means, presumably, uh, by the time you all hit, hit ground, your platoons are going to be a division asset. You're going to be C2'd um, through the uh, collection manager, and probably going to be working in coordination with uh, recon elements again, scouts. The, the world is more dangerous now for electronic warfare soldiers than it was even 12 years ago when I was a, a lieutenant. Few things have changed. The enemy now has ground surveillance radar. It's a radar that's angled downward and it can track foot traffic foot movement. Enemy has these group one UASs, the, the quadcopters, the, the cheap systems. We didn't face an adversary that was making a lot of effective use of that uh, over the last 20 years. Enemy is also going to have electronic warfare capabilities. Taliban, Al-Qaeda, the insurgents that we've been facing over the last 20 years, they just didn't have anything to speak of. right? You are the hunter, and you are the hunted. Back when I was a PL, we had this term for insignia called low-level voice intercept. Uh, that, it was a four-person team carrying, we had a, a system called a PRD-13. It was a 1980s, 1970s era piece of technology, still quite effective, to be honest. But the thing weighed 
across four, four people, 55 pounds. Oh, okay, we carry 15 pounds a person. That's not too bad. Well, the mission was to be able to go out 20 kilometers in front of the forward line of troops, just inside of friendly artillery range so that you could have cover in case you needed to retrograde, and self-sustain for 72 to 96 hours. Suddenly, that 55-pound piece of equipment is not my limiting factor. Now I'm carrying ammunition, 800 rounds for the saw, 210 rounds per person for the M4s that you're carrying. Now I'm carrying four days' supply of food and water. I'm carrying shelter. I'm carrying batteries. I'm carrying solar panels. I'm carrying e-tools. I'm carrying 100 pounds, piece, 100 pounds of equipment per soldier, and I have to hump it 12 miles up and down hills. One man's personal opinion, I don't really care that much about your ACFT score, but if you're going to be a platoon leader for a team like that, you better be able to ruck. Because you better understand what your soldiers are going to have to be able to do if they are called to perform a mission similar to that. Now there's some debate as to whether that is going to be the, the future of dismounted operations. But if you're going to a light unit, you may not have vehicles and you may need to go out to a location to be the eyes and ears of the commander that's out front. And your most casualty producing weapon system is a squad automatic weapon. It's an incredibly dangerous job that your soldiers are going to have to perform. And if you have to see to it as a platoon leader, coordinating multiple teams, in order to get multiple lines of bearings, in order to produce that fix for targeting purposes, it's a lot of very precious talent that's being put in very dangerous places. And you have to know what that's going to be like and be able to articulate that capability to the commander. So your responsibility up is to make sure that your higher headquarters knows what you're capable of performing. It means you cannot sugarcoat it. And your responsibility down is to train your soldiers well enough that they can survive that mission. You need to take care of them, you need to take care of their families, and you need to make sure that they're ready to perform a mission like that. Because we don't know what the next conflict is going to look like. The Army has relied on joint assets for its electronic warfare capabilities for a long time. We've had the luxury of being able to rely on the Air Force for a system called a compass call. It's an incredibly powerful electronic warfare suite. And it flies in a C-130. C-130 is not nimble. <laughs> but we were facing an adversary that had no counter air to speak of. So it could fly, permissive, easy. It's not going to be the case necessarily against a near peer threat with actual air defense capability or an air force. So the first couple of months, we may be fighting in, in an, a, a capable adversary without the joint assets that we had previously become reliant on. It may very well be that your platoon is the electronic warfare capability allocated to that brigade or that division for the first couple of months. That's what I need you to be ready for. Any questions so far? Go ahead. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, you mentioned about the enemy having air defense artillery uh, weapon systems where the radars are really loud and we mm -hmm. can detect it from miles away. Yeah. And we ourselves, we have our own systems. Mm -hmm. So what steps have we taken to mask our signals so that the enemy does not necessarily get to see them or detect them? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So 10th Mountain, we're running a, a training iteration that we're calling Hunter EMS. And, and it's getting after specifically that question. The basic setup is we've got electronic warfare teams that are out trying to find the radars, and the radar techs are out with their pieces of equipment trying to gain, get an air picture without being seen. Um, they're learning how to do that. 
and so far they have been quite successful actually in evading our ability to find them with the pieces of equipment that we have. Hoping to fix that when that man comes and brings a little bit better piece of equipment uh, next week, right? Um, the Army, as previously mentioned, does not have uh, any program of record equipment right now. And most of the really good equipment that we have is, or not the entire Army, but 10th Mountain does not have any currently fielded program of record equipment. And clarify that. Um, what we do have, though, are systems that were built for a counterinsurgency fight. Right? And most of those uh, frequency range 20 megahertz up to about 6 gigahertz, so you can cover the top end Wi-Fi and all of that. Well, some of these systems, and what we're training on as our own systems, um, we allocated, uh, we got spectrum allocation for them between 9 and 9.5 gigahertz. So if, if you have a system that can sense up to 6 gigahertz and you have a, an emitter that's producing signals at 9 gigahertz, you have a math problem. Um, so we're having to bring out other pieces of equipment. And some of those are good in the Eastern European-like terrain of Fort Drum with the snow and the rock and the trees. Some of them are really good at the proving grounds where they're getting an elevated position and it's desert. They're not necessarily the same system. But to, get your, to actually answer your question, the radar techs are starting to figure out how long it takes when they emit before they get found and they're turning off and moving. We actually had, during uh, when we were playing HICOM, we actually had a, a rotating general officer come in to, to guest command, and our counter battery <laughs> warrant officer said, hey, you know, sir, we're gonna do this queuing schedule, we're gonna have this Q64 turn on, get air picture, emit for about five minutes, and then it's gonna turn off, and then this one's gonna turn on and get air picture while that other one moves, and then uh, the third one's going to turn on, the second one's going to turn off, and then that one's going to move. And we're just going to keep moving around our radars so we, contain, we continue to get 100% air picture, but none of our systems are in place long enough to be targeted. It's an old TTP. We're relearning old stuff with new systems. But he'd never heard of that before. And frankly, neither had I prior to coming to 10th Mountain, right? But there are also things like site selection. Right, so if you, when you go to the qualification course, you're gonna find out about something called a side lobe. Well, that radar is looking up and out, but because of how the physics of EM emissions works, you're going to get the, 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 what's called a side lobe off the side and down, um, and you'll be able to detect those as well. So even though the, the, it's radiating up and out, you're still going to be able to detect it down. Now those side lobes were like 10 million times the strength of the sun locally, right? So the sun's definitely more powerful than the radar, don't get me wrong, right? But by the time the, the, the radiation, the, the emission reaches us, it's usually sitting at around negative 130 decibels, and, and we were picking them up at, at around negative 60 decibels. Every 10 decibels is a factor of 10 for power level. So that's, what, 10 to the... 7th, 10 to the 8th, um, math in public, it's not a good idea. But it's still very, very loud, right? So, and that's off the side lobe. So it was a genuine question to the commander, is it worth turning this asset on to maintain an air picture? Because you can be found and you can be targeted. So when is it worth turning it on? And how long do you leave it on? Right? We're figuring this stuff out. And that's what you all will be responsible for doing, is help us continue to evolve our understanding of what EW in the modern environment looks like. It used to be just turn the radar on and it's fine. They don't have the ability to, to find it, and if, and if they did, they wouldn't have the ability to kill it. Not the same anymore. It's a good question. Any, what, what other questions? So with uh, cyber officers having uh, a larger effect in a tactical environment, like you were explaining, where you have to go out and be the eyes and ears of the commander, do you think that they may start prioritizing more of those uh, 
positions and authorizations for those 17 Bravos and divisions like the 10th Mountain or the 3rd Infantry? Do I think that they will? Sir, you want to take that one? Yes, sir. Hey, so Brian Vile, and uh, I actually have three different jobs. So one of them is Commandant of the Cyber School, the other one is Chief of Cyber. So 100% of that answer is on me. So every year what we do, actually twice a year, I go to the General Barrett, who's the R Cyber Commander. She's my three-star level top cover. And so for all of the billets across the United States Army, what we do is we generate a biannual memo uh, that's aligned with what we call the uh, AIM cycle. It's what everybody else uses except for, you know, new entry soldiers. Uh, that says what are the priorities for the Army. So within the force comm formations, within the tactical armies, the corps, the divisions, and everything else, what we do is we look to the four-star commander that owns that mission. We literally ask the force comm commander to say, what are your priorities, and then we will execute them on your behalf. So 100% of the prioritization for the 17 Bs and where they're going to go for the force comes directly from the operational force. And we simply execute that on their behalf. So does that answer the question? Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Good morning. Okay, so the question was uh, understanding that there's a shortage of officers, how do we best prepare the warrants and NCOs? Um, so there is a similar shortage uh, of warrants. I think the enlisted side is, is a little bit healthier. Um, the schoolhouse is producing as many uh, qualified soldiers as, as they can. Um, the best way that you can prepare your warrants is to get out of their way and let them be warrants. So I am blessed with a CW3 who could do my job way better than I do. I can't do his job nearly as well as he can, but I can do my job. As an officer, do officer things. Let your warrants do warrant things. If they are required to fill your role, they are capable of doing so, but they really have better things to do than your job. North-South from the warrants in the room? Okay. No, it's a good question. Sir, how much, um, or what's the collaboration like working with either like MI or Signal in terms of the type of plans you're putting together and briefing to the commanders? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, so it depends on, on the operation when we were going through our warfighter. So warfighter really is the time where you, where you start smoothing out those staff processes. Um, Outside of that, you're, you're kind of in your own lanes, you know, you're training your, your, your folks, but that's, that's the warfighter or uh, an NTC rotation, those collective training events, that's really where you get the opportunity to, to practice this. Um, we have a wonderful working relationship with the two section, the SEMA and, 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 um, G, and the G2 and the collection manager. Um, some of the things that we did in the warfighter, we actually armed one of the collection managers uh, ISR assets with a Hellfire, and the collection manager got to kill stuff, which was fun for an intel soldier, for an, for an intel officer. Um, you're going to work hand in hand, right? So uh, right now, I there are a number of working groups that are that are going on at the division that I would love to be a part of. I have to prioritize because I just don't have the people to send to all of them. Targeting is is number one. The IPB process, the intelligence preparation of the battlefield, just don't have the bodies for to, to have them be part, because that's, that's an ongoing, continual process. It would, it would subsume an entire uh, two soldiers actual uh, time to, to make it work, and I just don't have that, that, that number. But when we get into the targeting meetings, and we're getting into the, the, what are called the targeting working groups, 
outline, here, here's where we think the enemy is, here's what the high priority targets are, how are we going to get after them? That's when we all get together and we're like, okay, that's how we're gonna kill it, and it's lethal, what do you got? Non-lethal, what do you got, right? And we build these, the, the plans together, all, all, all of us in the room collaborating, and I will, I will tell you that as a staff officer, the best way to be effective and to build the relationships with your fellow staff officers is to take work off of other people's plates. If you are competent and able to perform your mission and able to solve their problems, they will love you forever. If on the other hand, you cause them problems or because you're not doing your job, you're making them have to work harder, you will be ostracized immediately. I think that's probably just generally true, but it's especially true at an organization that has to move and uh, move, shoot, and communicate on a continual basis that quickly. Um, the maneuver folks want to hear from you, as long as you have something to contribute. If you don't have anything to contribute, stay silent until you have something to contribute. Does that answer your question? Okay. Great questions. These are fantastic questions. What else? All right. So I will close with my expectations for, for the lieutenants, right? All of that competence, leadership, troop leading procedures, all of that still valid. You're going to be in a position where, because you are high demand and low density, you're going to have to be more expert at things that uh, sooner than your, your peers and other branches. It, it's, just, it's just the nature of being part of a branch that, that is, is so short and such high demand. So I need you to dig into FM 3-0, need you to dig into FM 5-0, need you to understand ATP 3-12.3, and I really need you to bring up ATP 3-12.4, electronic warfare platoons. That is your baseline for how you will lead your, your platoon formations. Then, I need you to train and practice with the units that you're going to be supporting so you can take your TTPs, your tactics, techniques, and procedures, and blend them with the supported units. Because the other thing that you will end up finding is that if you, pr if you prove to be a battlefield liability to the units that you're supporting, they will not take you with them. And you will have gone through all of your training and you'll be operationally useless. Cyber is a team sport. <laughs> Multi-domain operations is a team of teams sport. You play into everything. You're connected with everything. Everything relies in some part on you and you rely in some part on everything else. You have to understand a more holistic picture in order to be most effective. So I need you to be better, I need you to be fitter, and I need you to lead your people. Thank you.